Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're coming to you live from Hoss Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. Um, glad to have you with us today. We've got Big Jim on the ones and twos in our production room. Everybody say hey to Big Jim. Hey Big Jim. All right, so uh, glad to have you with you on the show. Glad to have you with us on the show today. On today's show, we're going to have our usual show and tell segment. We're also uh, in our main segment going to talk about sweet potatoes, everything sweet potatoes, and then we're going to get into some of your questions from last week. Now, if you have any questions, please put those in the comments, and we'll pick some of those to answer on next week's show. So, if any of your questions. Add those in the comments. We'll be sure to get to those in a future show. Now, are you eating again? Mm -hmm. What are you eating this time? Sweet corn. Raw? Raw sweet corn. So I got up about daylight this morning and I pulled a big old heaping wheelbarrow load of sweet corn. Yeah? Yep. For the dew was still on the leaves? The dew was still on the leaves and Miss Hoss, as we speak, is creaming it and we'll put it in the freezer. Mm, that'd be good stuff. Yep. That'd be good stuff. Ambrosia. Ambrosia. Let me show you one that I ain't been gnawing on. <laughs> Look at that. And that's, that's some pretty stuff. That's pretty right there. That's like old uh, Andy Webb said, it's so good it don't make it to the house. That's right. That's right. You know, I've never been one to eat sweet corn raw, but I tried it the other day and dead good. That's good. Yeah, the only time I've ever really had it raw, they cut it off the cob, put it in salad sometimes. Seem, uh, I've had it raw like that. Well, I ate a whole cob sitting there, standing there in the corn patch the day. Yeah. Right, me and the dogs. Silks and everything? No, I, well, I did the best I could, but they had some silks on, but silks ain't going to hurt you. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on the tail end of harvesting mine right now. Uh, I've probably got a few of the late ears to get. We're going to do a low country bowl this Friday. Yep. I'm going to harvest the rest of it for that. Yep. I, I got the same plans. So, uh, you know, we all are, are creatures of habit. Right. For years, I have been playing Silver Queen. Years. Years. I mean, I've grown some other stuff. I grew Silver King one year. And I grew some peaches and cream. But I always went back to my Silver Queen. Well, last year, we grew this ambrosia. At the expo. At the expo. Mm -hmm. And, and I've grown it this year. Regarding I didn't grow the Silver Queen, and I really like it. And it's hard to step out there and do something a little bit different, but I encourage people to do that, to try something different. Now, let's talk about corn just for a minute, because there's several different varieties of corn. Right, right. So, and classifications. Okay. So as far as sweet corn goes, sweet corn is classified by different genes that it has in it. And those different genes make some sweeter than others. Right. So that the different genes, it, it basically determines the the sugar versus the starch ratio. Some have more sugar, uh, less starch, some more starch, less sugar. So there, there's more than these three out there, but these are the basic three genes that you're gonna find in most right. corn varieties that you right. have. So we start off with the SU gene, which is what we call standard varieties of corn, mm -hmm. sweet corn. So if it was an heirloom variety, it would fall into the standard, but not all standards are heirlooms. Right, okay. Right. <clears throat> so the standard variety includes your silver queen, right. like you said. Um, the standard variety has less sugar and more starch than these other two. As a result, the storage on it is the least of these three gene types. That's something that I did not know. So, uh, you know, with Silver Queen and stuff like that, you want to process it and eat it pretty quick. It's not going to have a long shelf life in the fridge. Right. So you want to pick it and, and eat it pretty quick. Yep. So if you're not going to eat it soon, I would just leave it on the stalk. Yep. And, uh, That's what we used to do. We would pull it, carry it to the house, shuck it, put it up in the same day. Right. And that's the reason it always worked well for us. Uh, if you are going to grow it for market and you need some storage out there, you definitely need to look at some of these other, I mean, these other varieties and these other sugar contents for storage. Right. So the, the second one here, the SE gene, stands for sugary extender. Okay, so this one is going to have more sugar than the standard varieties, more sugar and a little less starch. 
Now these right here, this is like the ambrosia that we uh, grew this year. Yep. Uh, peaches and cream, incredible. There, there's 20 or so of them out there. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. So um, this variety can store up to four days in the fridge. And uh, I've kind of tested that this year, and that's about right. I can pick it, and uh, it's good about four days. After that, it gets kind of starchy tasting. Yeah. But uh, so you got a little window there mm -hmm. on that. And then the last one here, which we've never grown personally, a lot of our friends have, is, has the SH2 gene. And that's what we call the super sweets. And those are, uh, they have the smaller kernels on them. And those, they say, will store up to 10 days wow. in the fridge. Wow. So you got, the more sugar you got, seems like the more storage uh, capability you have there. And uh, I wouldn't mind trying one of these super sweets. Yeah, I, I probably will too. Now let's talk about the flip side of growing these super sweets. They're more finicky to grow than the standards are. So if you're in a situation where you may not be able to give it all the water it needs and you may not be able to plant it just right and you need something that's a little forgiving, definitely go with the standard varieties here because they are more forgiving and they do tend to make more in adverse conditions than, right. than the super sweets does. The super sweets, the germination has to be just right for the soil temperature for them to germinate. They take the right amount of water, the right amount of fertilizer. Everything's got to be in pretty good shape to make those. Now they will yield more, I think, probably. And they do have, like we talked about, the longer shelf life. But the drawbacks is, is everything's got to be perfect. So if you don't have all the water, all the fertilizer, you need something a little bit forgiving, probably stick to some of the standard varieties. Yeah, so I wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't grow the um, the super sweets unless I definitely had it on drip tape and had some fertilizer injection there. That way you could really control. Uh, and they, they several, all these, the standards, the super sweets and all that, come in white, yellow, and bicolor. Right. And that's something about the bicolor, now, if, if I was blindfolded, I probably couldn't tell you the difference. The bicolor just looks like it tastes better. It does, yeah. It just, just looks like it tastes better. And what's what's unique is uh, I planted my corn probably at least two to three weeks before you did. Yeah. And mine came in last week. And yeah. Yours is coming in this week. Yeah. A lot of times it doesn't make that much difference. It's, it's more for heat units. And mine got waist high at best. Yeah. Smallest corn I've ever grown in my life. I told somebody that was out there today it was midget corn. Midget corn. Midget corn. Midget corn. I had to bend over to pick but it. But I mean, it didn't look great, but it made good corn. So yeah, that might have been, had something to do with your uh, you, your weed pressure was a little higher because you didn't get a good a, a, a shade canopy that was. Uh, well, that and I transplanted it too. I tried something a little bit weird this year, so I don't, I'm not sure I'll do that again. Right. So that, yeah. Anyway. So, we got our, uh, we'll be finishing up picking that corn, and then uh, I like to come in and take a machete and chop mine down and let it dry a little bit before I pull up the drip tape. I did that this morning. So, when I got through harvesting my corn, I went back with what we got a corn sickle, and I chopped my, my stalks down. And the reason I did that with, it's a lot easier to take those green stalks and cut them down. You let them get dry, they get really tough, and then you're the impossible to cut. Right. So I like to cut them when the grain right when I get through putting that corn, I like to cut them all off, let it start decaying, and uh, go in there. And I'm going to probably plant something behind that. Yeah. Yeah. I have piled up the stalks before and just burned them right there. Yeah. Um, there's several different ways you can get rid of them. All right. So speaking of sweet corn and harvesting sweet corn, our tool of the week this week is something that really, really is a big help if you're out there harvesting sweet corn. All right. So what we have here is the over the shoulder harvesting bucket. And I'm gonna pick it up here because we got a little, we got a lot of frame here in the camera. But you can see here, and this baby goes over the shoulder and it's got a pad in the back and it's adjustable right here for you boys that's got the big old bandits. You can adjust that or you can adjust it in. So you can put it wherever you want to to pick. It's pretty good size there. It's got a nice little curve here, so yep. it kind of contours your body. Yeah, yeah. Put it there, and we use this thing for everything. You can tomatoes, corn, okra, blackberries, blueberries. 
You can put the babies in there if you need to. It's big, it's comfortable to wear, and this thing's made in the USA, and it's one of our signature products. We sell lots of it. Kudos that one. Yep. Yeah. It's really nice for sweet corn because even if your rows are 36 inches wide, you can't get your wheelbarrow down the middle of them rows. So you leave your wheelbarrow on the outside of your corn pack and you can slide through them rows and fill that up, dump it in your yep. wheelbarrow and go back. You ain't got your hands full and you, you got both hands to pull with. It works really good. Now, I even like it for tomatoes, things that are low. Now, you would think when you lay down, or when you lean over, it kind of lean over, but it kind of sits up straight. So when you lean over, it pretty much sits level, and you just fill it on up. Now, if you've ever watched much YouTube, well, Wrangler Star uses our picking bucket on blueberries. Some, for blueberries on some of his YouTube channels. Yeah, and he's got, he lives out here in uh, Washington State. and got a lot of apple trees and yeah. stuff. Yep. Um, really handy for berries and stuff like that. Uh, figs, I use it a lot for figs. Yep. Anything that is kind of waist level or higher, you, you pick in twice or in half the time because you're using both hands. And did I mention it's made in the USA? It is made in the USA. Yep. Okay. And we, we have never had one sent back. Never. Not thousands never. and thousands. Thousands. We've never had one sent. In fact, we've never had a complaint. No, not that I know of. Which is unusual. Yeah. All right. So, now to get into the meat of today's show, we are going to talk about sweet potatoes. So, uh, we both just got through planting some sweet yep. potatoes last week, and uh, it's around that time. Sweet potatoes, here in the summer, when it just gets so hot and humid, there's only a few things we can grow. We can grow okra. Yep. Eggplant and pepper seem to do okay. Yep. Tomatoes, not so much, but eggplant and peppers will do okay, and then sweet potatoes. Yeah, insect-wise, you're going to have a few white flies get on them, but sweet potatoes do pretty good in our hot, dry summers or our hot uh, summers down here as far as insect disease pressure. Uh, we ain't been growing them three or four years yet, so we by no means are an expert on them, but we have done pretty good with them. And uh, it's one of the things that we do like to grow in our second planting or our second succession planting. We like to plant. I just planted mine yesterday and uh, my corn's coming off. So you could go behind corn. You could go behind some of your squash and things like that. Go behind your, your regular potatoes. Yep, with regular potatoes, with, uh, with sweet potatoes. So it's a good thing to grow in the summertime. They normally, if we plant them now, they'd be coming off, what, October? Yeah, that's usually uh, 100 days or so, yeah. but you can leave them in the ground longer than that. Yeah, they uh, the, the sweet potatoes. They we always wait till they break, show enough hot, May or June to plant them. Sweet potatoes do not like cool weather. No, not at all. So we we wait till we get that first rotation of spring crops out of the way, and then plant the sweet potatoes. Now in some some northern climates, I know they kind of plant sweet potatoes closer to everything else. Uh, but, but we always wait till till June or so to plant them. Yeah, you can, like I said, you can plant sweet potatoes behind regular potatoes without any worry of much disease crossover because sweet potatoes are not related to potatoes. Hmm. Sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family. And if you've ever got morning glory in your garden, next to your sweet potatoes, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. Yep. So potatoes are related to nightshades, tomatoes, stuff like yep. that. Sweet potatoes are related to morning glory. So we can plant them behind one another. Now I don't even worry about that. When we plant sweet potatoes, much different than potatoes, we don't plant cuts. We plant what they call slips, or some of the old timers call them draws. Yep. So what they do, the guys that actually grow these plants will plant sweet potatoes. A lot of them use greenhouses nowadays, but they'll plant sweet potatoes, and off these sweet potatoes, slips or sprouts will come up. And they'll go in there and pull these things. Now, they may have just a little bit of root system, but they really don't have much. Mm -hmm. And then you plant that slip, and that's where you get your potatoes from. Right. So the, the guys I've talked to, excuse me, what they do is they basically have a huge greenhouse, and it's like a really long raised bed. It's not that deep. Right. And what they go in there is they just fill this, this bed or this wood structure with sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. Just layer them in there thick. Cover them up with a little bit of dirt, and then once them sawdust, a lot of them use sawdust. sawdust yep. Once those slips or sprouts coming up, and they get an order or whatever, they just pluck them up, bundle them up, and uh, 
Yeah, most of them's in what packs of twenty five. I think twenty five, yeah. sometimes a hundred. Um, we like to get our slips from a place in Gleason, Tennessee, called Steel Plant Company. They're one of the largest yep. sweet potato plant producers in the country. And if you, you order from any other company, they, they most likely all all the time come from Steel. And um, good folks over there. I think their website is sweetpotatoplant.com. Yep. And uh, they've got a, a good diff, good selection of different varieties that are, are productive varieties. Yeah, Dan Faith uh, posted on our Row by Row group this morning where he was planting some sweet potatoes. And he's planting Beauregard, Beauregard variety. Right. Uh -huh. And he said he got his from George's uh, plant farm out of Tennessee. Yeah. I'm not real familiar with them, but I did go to the website look around. It's a nice website he's got there. And they have some unique varieties that I hadn't seen before. He's got a couple different purple varieties. Hmm. Yeah, so evidently Tennessee is a hotbed for growing sweet potatoes. Well, plants. we here in the South used to grow a lot of sweet potatoes and a lot of sweet potato plants, but we have a beetle and we've been in a quarantine for the last number of years. So the best recollection I have, these most parts of Tennessee is not under any type of quarantine, but here in South Georgia we are under quarantine and we can't ship plants to certain locations. So I got you. I got you. And then so we planted ours, I planted mine this past weekend, you planted yours last Friday. We got our slips from a, a local uh, deal here lately just because we were in a, we wanted to get them planted soon and we didn't want to wait on the shipping time. Um, I planted mine this year. The first year I grew sweet potatoes about four years ago, I didn't put any drip on them, nothing. Didn't fertilize them much. Kind of starved them a little bit like you do okra. And I had bumper crop, several wheelbarrow loads. And these last two years, just because I was trying to make things easy, I put them, put drip on them, and was putting a little nitrogen to them for the injection. And my sweet potatoes, and I got a decent harvest, but I had a lot of them look real stringy, almost like a rope. And I did a little research, and from best what I can figure out, that that is a result of too much nitrogen or too much feeding and too much water. And so this year, what I did was I just did kind of like the fad system minus the drip. So I made me a furrow, put me some compost in it. That made me a nice little hill and planted my sweet potatoes in that. And I'm going to just, I watered them in to, to get them established, but I'm going I'm to let Mother Nature take care of them for the most part and see how we do with that. Well, I did put drip on mine. I, right. I put drip on it because I know how hot and dry it can get. So... I did a little insurance policy there, put mine on drip, and I'm probably going to try to do the same thing too. I'm not going to feed them and water them as much as I normally do. Maybe stress them a little bit because it is a tuber. So if you stress that plant some, it makes you think that that tuber is going to be more, um, it's going to create more potatoes, more uniform potatoes than something that's not stressed. So I'm going to give it a try too. Now the variety that we planted in the past, we planted Covington. And we planted Burgard and Centennial. And Centennial. So we planted, we went back to Covington this year. So last year, first year I grew them, I planted Covington when I had such a great crop. The second year I planted Beauregard, yep. which was okay. Last year I did Covington and Centennial side by side. And the Covington outperformed the uh, Centennial. Now yep. I can't. Somebody puts a bunch of varieties in front of me. I can't tell the difference between them, taste-wise, really, or looks-wise. But I, as far as productivity-wise, the Covington has, has done the best for me so far. The Covington was released from North Carolina State, and about and North Carolina produces a lot of sweet potatoes. About ninety percent of all the sweet potatoes commercially grown in North Carolina are, are the Covington variety. The Beauregard, I believe, is a variety released by LSU. It wasn't it didn't perform that great for us. Now they tell me that the Beauregard is probably the one you need to plant if you're starting out because it takes less fertilizer and it's more forgiving than some of the other varieties for the home gardener. But it just wasn't our favorite. So we're going back to Coventry. Now I read somewhere where there's over 400 varieties. I read somewhere else where there's over 650 varieties. So folks, there's a lot of different varieties of sweet potatoes out there and I'm sure a lot of people grow something that they may hand it down from their family or something they've grown for years that's their favorite. So they is a bunch, if you go to look around the sweet potato varieties, you can really get confused because there is a lot of them. 
Yeah. Um, there's even the, a lot of people like the uh, the red skin ones, which are called Georgia Jets. Yep. Uh, I'm not really sure where they were. I assume they were maybe developed in Georgia. But uh, a lot of people like those red, darker skin ones. Um, we've never tried to grow in those. Um, like you said, there's the purple ones. So Baker Creek, who's always got some unusual seeds and stuff, they've got a lot of these uh, purple ones like you see right here. But I, in talking with the guys at Steel, they said that these are more kind of novelty stuff, that they're not, you know, some of this heirloom stuff looks neat, but it's not that productive. And so... Um, we did talk with Jerry a couple years ago, and the guy that owns Baker Creek, and he really liked growing the purples. And anytime you got a purple vegetable, then it's very high to antioxidants. Right. So he was really going on about some of the purple varieties that they had found and really liked them. Now that being said, that's in Missouri. So they may have better luck growing some of these varieties in Missouri than we do here in the South. Right, right. And one more thing about sweet potatoes, and I can't remember who it was that posted in our group. And if you're not a member of our Road by Road group on Facebook, you need to get in there and uh, really good interaction, really good pictures. We learn new stuff every day from people in the group. But somebody was planting a heap of sweet potatoes, and their theory was what I don't harvest, it basically is a, a cover crop, ground cover, a food plot for the deer. Well, Dan, Dan actually said that. He okay. said that he was planting 2,800 square feet, and that was around 3,000 plants, and they used it for deer food, and deer love sweet potatoes. Right. Whatever they get to eat. Right. So, so it makes an easy cover crop, because then once the vines get growing, it's going to, you know, I plant mine on about four or four foot row spacing. Once those vines get in there, it's going to cover that ground and shade out any yeah. leaves. Well, one thing that I didn't know until last year were the actual leaves are edible. And a lot of people in Asia and the Philippines like to take these leaves and stir fry them down and eat them. I actually had a lady come out to the expo and ask if she could get some. She was an Asian lady. And she got some and she was explaining to me that they stir fry them and they really like them. Hmm. So maybe something I'll try this year. Well, there's definitely plenty of leaves on the plant to try. Yep. You're not going to go They home. said there's actually there was more nutrient quality to the leaves and it was actual sweet potato, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So good info there on sweet potatoes, growing sweet potatoes, some different varieties. Tell us what your favorite variety is and how you grow them. Do you starve them? Do you feed them good? And we'd like to, to hear that because like we said, we're definitely no professionals on growing sweet potatoes and we'd like to learn from you guys as well. Now one other thing, uh, the, the commercial guys will actually mow off the leaves a week before they harvest the potato. And they say that makes the skin thicker and it makes the potato store better. Hmm. So okay. they mow the leaves off and then a week later they come in and dig them. So I'm going to try that this year. Mow the leaves off. Okay. So I mean, you would need your potatoes to be flat, planted flat uh, even on the ground yeah. to, to yeah. do that. Uh, okay, that's, that's interesting. You try that too. All right, so let's get into some of your questions uh, that you submitted on either the Facebook feed or, or the YouTube edit. And uh, like I said, put your questions in the comments. If we answer your question on the show, send us an email to here, and we'll send you one of these free koozies here. So um, send us your address to that, and we'll get the koozie to you if we answer your question. So Scott Cash sent us a question in. What set of tools do you recommend getting for someone just starting to garden? What size garden do you recommend starting with? Well, Scott, I would probably say something in the neighborhood of a 40 by 40 or maybe even smaller. It's according to how much time you have. But you definitely want to smart small, work your way up because, as we talked before, failure is not good. And when people fail, have a failure, they tend to get discouraged and not try again. Start small and you can gradually make your garden bigger. You'll be really surprised how much you can produce off a of 40 by 40. Now, what I would recommend for a 40 by 40 is the single wheel hoe. We're big believers in the wheel hoe. A single wheel hoe with maybe a couple of attachments, a couple good hand hoes, and that's basically all you need. Right, yeah. You can take that single wheel hoe with the teeth and an oscillating hoe and the plows. And the plows. And then maybe that single time cultivator. I mean, you can, yep. you can those 
those little small collection of tools, you can really, really do a lot. That with a good water sprinkler and good water hose is all you need to get, really get started. That's right. That's yeah. right. And then once you get going, you can move into some drip and some, some other stuff right. like that. As far as the garden size, from some surveys we do, our customer base, the average size garden is about 5,000 square feet. But, but I think, like you said, starting out with a 40 by 40. Yeah. And, and if you go bigger than that, don't make that 40 by 40 bigger. Make you another 40 by 40 plot. Yep. And that's a really good size plot. Nice, manageable, workable plot. So I'd much rather have four different 40 by 40 plots than one big 200 by 200. We found out years ago it's a lot more manageable like that than plots because you can do your rotation better. You can do cover crops. It just works so much better. Yeah. You can go out in the garden. I'm going to weed this plot today. I'm going to go through this plot today. And then I'm going to take you 10 minutes to plot. And it just, you don't get overwhelmed near as much that way. All right. So thank you, Scott, for that question. Send us your address and we'll get a koozie on your way. All right. Our second question for today is from John Taylor. And he says, with using drip irrigation in the summer, how often should you water and how long should you water? Now, this is a little bit of a loaded question because this is going to depend on where you live. Also, what you're growing because different plants are going to need different amounts of water. Yeah, so when I first plant, and I just planted some cucumbers a couple of days ago, I turned it on, and I plant on top of the emitter. So I turned it on. Heck, 10, 15 minutes is all it needs because all I want to do is wet that seed. Mm -hmm. Now, as those plants get bigger and you got more leaves and you're trying to sustain a big plant, and the more leaves you got, the more moisture that plant's going to lose on a hot day, you're going to have to water it more often. So, when my plants get big, I will probably run my drip irrigation a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, at least two hours. Um, and that's going to also depend on whether you. You're, if you're watering transplants, peppers, tomatoes that you put right on top of a emitter, yeah. you're not going to need to water it as long as if you got something like corn where you've got plants between emitters and you really want to soak that bed. Yeah. And then in the heat of summer, I have in past years let it run on my corn all night. I have to. And it, yeah. can, it can soak it up. Corn, when it goes to silk and when it goes to tossing out, it needs a lot of water. And that Another thing to do is I do frequent irrigation. So I will water at least every other day, if not every other day, when the fruit is being put on, when the corn's tasseling, silking, things like that. I water every day to every other day. My concern is I do not want that plant to stress. And with the drip irrigation, there's no reason why you should let that plant stress. Right. So, yeah, I, I believe in every other day. It, that's, that's assuming we don't get any rain. I got two inches on Sunday. Uh, or Saturday, and I, I haven't watered since then. I'll probably water today. Uh, another thing you can look for is things like indic what I call indicator plants in your garden. So as far as stuff looking like it needs water, squash is going to be the first thing where you see them leaves kind of fold and yeah. turn over. So if you see the squash doing that, you know everything else probably needs some water. So use those indicator plants as a good sign uh, to tell you that stuff is going to need some water. Yep. All right, and then one last question this week. We're actually going to get to three questions this week. It's from Earl Gamage, and it got a short, simple question, but a very, very interesting one. It wants to know what plants do we heal, or what plants do we throw dirt to in the garden? You know, I got to think about this. This is a very important question because there's certain plants that like to be healed: corn, tomatoes, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. We we heal our potatoes, right. our sweet potatoes, and our regular potatoes. Right. Now, there's certain plants that do not like to be healed. Cucumbers. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else I can think. Squash. I never heal my squash because if you go to throw in soil to some of these plants, like cucumbers, squash, things like that, you can actually do some damage. Lettuce, you can, obviously. You lettuce, heal. yeah. They'll, you'll smother them out. So, I don't throw, I don't heal okra. No. But uh, I, do, I guess the best way to put it is what plants do we heal. That would be tomatoes. Potatoes, sweet and Irish potatoes. Corn. Corn. I have healed some green beans before. Yeah, not not on a regular basis. I don't do that. So that's the only ones I can really think about that heal. Now I normally plant on flat. Right. And this just works for me. Everybody's got their own way of doing things, but I plant everything on flat, and then I heal the plants that I, that I heal, which is potatoes, tomatoes, and corn. Mm -hmm. Everything else I don't. 
So that's pretty much where I'm at. Right, and that, that interesting question talking about healing and planting on the flat, and planting on the hills, because uh, next week we're going to talk about some common garden misconceptions. Yep. So some things that you might be doing in your garden, you're just doing it because your grandpa did it, you don't really know why, and we're going to go through some of these misconceptions and kind of maybe bust a few myths and uh, myths and uh, explain what's the benefits of doing things a certain way or not another way. Maybe save you some time and some labor. We are creatures of habits, and sometimes those habits cost us <coughs> time. So we want to do things smart and do things wise so we get the most out of our work. That's right. We want to work smarter, not harder. No, that's right. All right. Well, that's it for this week's show. Hope you enjoyed it. We will see you guys next week. Take care.